everyone. Welcome to the first uh, of the UCGIS seminars for the 2021-2022 academic year. My name is Diana Sinton and I work for UCGIS as a senior research fellow and I am very pleased to be able to host uh, today's webinar. We're going to be hearing from Ashley Knapp who is a um, one of the instructors, a GIS professor at McAllister College uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota. And Ashley's going to be talking to us about her experiences in building an atlas with her students, her undergraduate students. We'll be hearing about the, um, the ways that she has worked with this both in print form and in digital form. Uh, as a reminder, uh, with UCGIS webinars, um, thank you for your patience in, in uh, jumping onto this unfamiliar platform for some of you, the uh, GoToWebinar. Uh, your microphones remain in an unmuted state during this presentation. Please feel free to put a question into the question space and we will have time at the end to um, go over questions um, and have some discussion with Ashley. So uh, people are going to continue to come in in the next few minutes, but I am going to now, Ashley, I'm going to turn this over to you as a presenter. And um, Ashley, feel free to turn your camera on or off, whatever you prefer. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, so happy to be here. Can you guys can, is my screen showing? I can get it. Uh, is your screen showing yet? It should be. Yes, your screen is showing. You're all set. Okay, cool. Thank you, Diana, for helping me navigate <laughs> this. Um, all right, so hi, everyone. I just wanted to uh share a little bit about uh making this cultural atlas uh so i'm gonna turn off my uh myself uh so you don't have to deal with uh, my face uh in your face um but i just wanted you all to see me and i work at McAllister college it's in st paul minnesota it's a very small liberal arts undergrad only institution um i think we have like 2200 students and that's big for us i think we might be creeping towards 2300 um and that's very very large for us uh when i attended as an undergrad i think we were closer to the 1800 mark so um so that's the kind of institution i'm at i'm at a pretty small place but all right so um, I'm going to just give a little bit of background about making this atlas, um, and this was an entirely student driven project. So um, I came up with kind of like the idea and kind of imposed a structure on it, but I, I did not create this atlas by any means. Uh, this was very, very much a student project. Um, so the one thing I want my students to know at the end of any of my classes um, is that they have an enormous amount of power when they're sitting in kind of like the designer's seat um, and that they kind of have a responsibility to be as transparent uh, with their data as possible. And kind of what I mean by that is data, as we all know in this you know, digital room, is that data doesn't equal truth, right? So a data, data is abstractions of reality and then we further abstract it by turning it into graphical representations right so you know as a as a data visualization designer or a cartographer or a graphic designer a lot of times what you're doing is you're taking data that's trapped in spreadsheets and text and then you're applying some graphical um variables to it and changing it into kind of a graphic encoding of that data and so that's an abstraction right and so we're getting further and further away from the phenomena that you're trying to represent um and so 
I think as a designer, it's always helpful to keep this in the back of your head is that, you know, you're, this is a snapshot of something. It's an abstraction. It is, it is not the phenomena itself. And to, and to try and communicate that as much as possible to the reader, um, that these data are in context, they're in a larger world, they're connected to other related phenomena and uh, to try and not have everything in a vacuum. And so for me, I really love narrative cartography or narrative design and trying to think about this idea of like expanding the role of a map. So um, I have always loved maps. I grew up with a dad who like read Atlas's cover to cover and we would do that together. And I really love that. And then I went to McAllister and I found out you could still make maps and I was real excited. I took my first GIS class and they taught cartography simultaneously with like the intro GIS skills. Uh, and we still do it that way. But I started also to realize kind of, you know, the the dark, sinister history of mapping as well, right? It, it, you know, at being a white, you know, European ancestry person, uh, maps, you know, I, I've basically always been the oppressor. And so for me, maps are like kind of exciting and fun and objects of wonder and kind of views into new worlds. But for a lot of people and communities, um, maps are tools of the oppressor, right? They're tools of the colonists, um, the settlers, and it's meant to catalog things and categorize and, um, you know, take, uh, take ownership over and kind of uh, codify that ownership and kind of institutionalize that. And so one of the other things I really love about creative cartography and narrative cartography is that it frees the map kind of from that tradition a little bit and tries to expand the role of maps. So these are kind of um, my inspirations. Uh, I had seen Portlandness, uh, I don't know, well, like years back now. And on a faculty development trip to Portland with uh, some other McAllister faculty, we got to meet with uh, David Bannis and Hunter Shobe. And I was really uh, excited to just pick their brains about everything to do with the Atlas. And I was like, oh, someday, someday I'll do this with my students. And uh, that someday kind of finally arrived. And um, so this is kind of the approach that we used. Um, a little while back at NASIS, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, but it's um, the North American Cartographic Information Society. They do an annual meeting. It's in Oklahoma City this year. Um, you can also attend digitally, but it's basically like a very small conference of people who love maps. And uh, there was a pre presentation by Lisa Charlotte Rost, and these are her images here. And she, had this question of like, what is a map? Well, you know, um, and how can we make map poetry? So it was a really impactful uh, presentation for me and something I actually use as an assignment now in my classes. And it's helpful to kind of break down um, barriers between class like classmates and me and the class. Uh, so the first assignment I have them do in the Cultural Atlas class or the GeoViz class, which is another advanced cartography class I do, is I make them create like basically a personal, a very personal map and it, it's a crafted map. So it's not digital, ideally done with your hands, drawing, painting, collage, whatever you got. And you have to answer one of these questions. So what do I overlook? What are my most valuable memories? What does my perfect place or city look like? Um, what does my place feel like to me, a city or whatever they consider their place? And this helps do two things. One is it creates an intimate setting right away because everyone has to be vulnerable in front of the other because we go around and present these and they're very personal questions. And so those, you kind of do like a little three to four minute blurb on them and we all go around and it kind of makes people um, 
immediately kind of let in to, to some personal space. And so that helps with critique later on down the line, because if everyone has already been vulnerable in a very personal way, critique is a little bit easier because you've already started building that rapport of a trust. Um, but more on the expanding role of maps. So that kind of gets them out of this GIS mindset, which most of my students come in with because uh, they have intro GIS as their prerequisite. So I show them some examples of kind of creative cartographies and expanding this role of maps and kind of getting them out of like the ArcGIS, QGIS space. Um, so the Rebecca Solnit um, atlases, Portlandness, um, kind of how to make maps personal, uh, how, how does an individual experience a place, and just to tell these kind of like multiple stories, right, these layers of stories of a singular place, right, everyone has their own personal experience of this space, and oftentimes those are never represented um, on a map. And then Additionally, allowing for more voices, more stories. So I love um, guerrilla cartography's projects of everyone makes a map and we just compile them into an atlas, which is another idea I stole from them. So each person in my, in my cultural atlas class had to make a two page spread and then we put them all together. So we did not uh, kind of uh, coordinate our colors or design. It does not have a cohesive feel to it once you're inside. So this class specifically, these are, um, I'm gonna talk mostly about the St. Paul Atlas. There is a Minneapolis, cause you know, we live in the Twin Cities. So we have St. Paul and Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, so there's a St. Paul Atlas, which was, I believe spring of 20 or yeah, 2019. And then uh, spring of 2020, we did Minneapolis. So we actually had to pivot for, uh, to remote learning for COVID um, on that one, which made it a little interesting to finish. And we can chat about that um, later if there's interest. But basically the rundown is there were 16 undergraduate students, uh, 10 of whom had no previous design software experience. So they were just coming in with their intro GIS uh, prereq, which we teach Esri products here. Um, but a lot of our students are Mac users. So a lot of them use QGIS on the side. Uh, most of our students were not local to St. Paul, and that's pretty much true of the college. Um, and we had all kinds of different majors and disciplines. Um, so far more than just geographers. Actually, I think we only have like four or five geographers in here. And then I had two undergraduate TAs that helped kind of troubleshoot design software, and they also made spreads. Our semesters are 15 weeks long, but we actually only had 13 weeks to produce this atlas because we needed the second, the two weeks for printing because most of these students were seniors and I needed to get them copies of the atlas before they graduated. So we, our, our timeline got shortened to 13 weeks. And um, we used 157 data sources all together and 24 named experts and interviewees, but I know that they consulted even more than that. Um, and then 21 softwares, apps, tools, or resources to put this together. Um, okay, so just to give you a sense of like, what am I talking about? What did they make? So these are some example spreads. Um, so these, cover two pages, you can kind of see the, the middle break there um, in these. But uh, it is actually an actual printed atlas, but it is also available digitally. Um, so you can go and check out the digital copy. And uh, they got to all choose their own topics, uh, which was an interesting, <laughs> uh, an interesting view into what they thought made St. Paul special. That was kind of the prompt of like what topics to cover and not being from around town, they had very different ideas than maybe someone who's lived here for a while, like myself. So this was the first iteration of this class and this was the, the, uh, the on the right was the Minneapolis version. So obviously you can see it on, on the left-hand side, it's the first iteration of the course. I have like kind of a vague idea of what we're gonna do. And then on the right-hand side is the second iteration. So it's much, uh, much more precise. And here's my crazy like course planning spreadsheet. 
if anyone wants access to my course materials, I'm happy to share them with anyone. Um, so the process, we did like a brief topic update of like two to three topics. Um, and then they had to do a quick lit review and kind of a formal proposal research plan outline type thing. They did a, a planning sketch and then they did a first draft, which was digital. And then they did a final draft uh, where we did a final critique kind of last polish and then they're ready to publish spread. And throughout the semester, these little grayed out areas, those are little uh, contributory like assignments uh, or like little progress journals. So that's primarily for grading and I'll just briefly touch upon that, but it was a way for us to keep in touch about what they were up to at any given point. Um, and so they just had, you know, uh, journal entries and we can talk and see what those look like. Um, but I, all of this was contract for B. So it was more about the process and the progress that they made than the actual product at the end. Um, okay, so here's topic brainstorming. So I let them kind of come up with any, we brainstormed as a group, like what are some things that make St. Paul special? And then they were also allowed to kind of bring in their own personal interests. So it was really anything goes. Um, but basically their topic update is like, you choose three, two to three topics, you look into, can I find data for it? Um, what would I need to do to collect that data? Is it something I have to go hand collect from somewhere or is it available? What might, what, what other data sets might I need that I haven't found yet? Um, and so on. So it's just kind of like a, almost like a viability study of a like real quick topics. And so the red ones are the ones we ended up in the atlas and then the black ones uh, were left out um, and there were far more than just these but this is gives you an idea of topics considered. The other thing I have them do for this course is choose um, a project focus. So in 13 weeks it is possible to do one of these really well, it is not possible to do all of them. So uh, you have to kind of choose what you're going to focus on. So I have them choose a project focus. So was, is it going to be a primary data collection, right? And a lot of students who choose the primary data collection as their kind of main focus for the project are people who already have design experience. So they feel very comfortable in their design abilities. You can see this is, this is a beautiful spread up top here, um, but they're really concerned with the, this kind of like data collection piece. Uh, storytelling is another option, like kind of working on how to present a narrative. Data wrangling and processing, again, usually for people who kind of feel good about their design capabilities, but really want to work is on like that background, data wrangling and processing. Um, some of these students are more data science uh, students or computer science students and want to learn or work with automating. The, some of these processes, or there are students who really want to work on charts and graphs kind of visualizations more than the, more than the mapping. And then uh, design and like merging interests. So for students who don't feel as comfortable with design software and like part of this class is learning the software, um, many of them chose design or how, how to apply data visualization to their, you know, specific field or so here's an example of field work. We have a Skyway system in St. Paul. And so uh, this stu student, Jenin, who's actually went on to, uh, to cartography master's program after this, uh, which was kind of fun, is that she wanted uh, to kind of work with design and primary data collection. So she went around and walked all of the all of the skyways in St. Paul. So you can kind of see this is kind of snapshots of her progress journal. Uh, so they were, I think, formatted as Google Slides. And so she just kind of gave me the slides of what she was doing. They took little, you know, photos and uh, put it together. Here's your first visit, um, little pictures of her journal and so on and so forth. Um, and then they would tell me next steps, like what am I planning to do this next week? So these were like every other week-ish kind of journal entries. So uh, another field work uh, kind of option was to do uh, interviews, right? So this was a close read of um, 
the memoir, The Late Homecomer. And Kao Kyla Yang is a, is a local uh, author and uh, from the Hmong community. And the Hmong community is a uh, really prominent and uh, sm strong community, unique kind of to St. Paul. And very much in like the fabric of the city. And so I was so excited that uh, one of my students, uh, Elston, wanted to take this on as her her uh, spread. And so she, one, I just loved the design inspiration. So I'm kind of obsessed with Hmong story claws. I think they're just like the coolest thing. Um, and so she did kind of, uh, this memoir straddles two geographic places, right? So you have um, kind of her, uh, experiences, the author's experience in, in Laos and Thailand, and then you have over here in the United States in St. Paul. And so she kind of split the spread into these two sections and she used that story, Hmong Smudori Cloth, as the design inspiration for the um, her story in Laos and Thailand, um, kind of as her as her experience of moving from one place to the next. And I love that the river uh, the Mekong on the le left side and and Mississippi on the right are connected and kind of are kind of the connecting piece of the story because it's very much so in in the memoir as well. So for her, she really uh, she interviewed the author um, and made sure you know it was okay to uh, to you know kind of give basically a teaser trailer of the memoir uh, in this spread. Uh, she also interviewed uh, Peter Radcliffe, who is uh, one of the founders of the Eastside Freedom Library, um, which includes the Hmong archives, and then talked to uh, Hmong activists and a Hmong archivist uh, through that as well. So there were lots of interviews and uh, background information collected for that piece. Again, GPS to collect some cave information here, historical archive work, especially for all of these little uh, drawings. So these drawings are actually from like early explorer, um, settler colonial explorers um, who uh, found, you know, quote unquote, <laughs> found these maps, uh, discovered these or discovered these caves and kind of their early sketching drawings of them. Um, so she replicated these, uh, Maggie replicated these um, and they kind of add a cool touch to this piece. They're all super old and in the public domain, so that's why that was so cool. Um, and then this one, oh, this is one of my favorite data collection ones. Uh, so for this spread, uh, Stella went through and all of the St. Paul Almanacs from 1903 to 1920, every year, she went uh, through and wrote down every uh, Chinese restaurant that was listed in the Almanac. And then at 1920, <laughs> she ran out of St. Paul Almanacs. They stopped producing them. And I was like, well, what? A, and she was like, I don't know where to go for data now. And I was like, well, they probably stopped producing them because of the phone book. So why don't you use the phone? She was like, oh, yeah, a phone book. So she went to the phone book. And uh, then we just did it by decade because by that point she was like, wow, this is taking a really long time. And I was like, yeah, yeah I'm sure it is. So um, then she just went, went by decade. So 1920, 1930, 40, 50, and so on. But it's such a cool data set to have. It's something that, uh, you know, no one had ever produced before. And so it's just, a, I think it's a really cool way of kind of digging out a small piece of history, digging out some really interesting data and, and making it visible in a way that it wouldn't have been previously. So for all of these spreads, you know, we had a, a, a lot of data sources for a lot of these. Um, and so we wanted to include those um, in the Atlas itself to kind of show, you know, this is, this is not just like our opinions, these are, these are previous work of other people or data sets or whatever. Um, so in the progress journals, we had like, here's the field work data collection piece, but it also had like an exploring your data kind of piece, right? So you, once you finally have the data in your possession, you have to actually experiment with it to see what kinds of question, you know, you ask questions of your data, you try and figure it out. Maybe you have enough data to answer the question, maybe you don't, maybe you start asking other questions and so on. So it's this iterative process and we all know this, right? It's, it's 
this is nothing new but i wanted them to actually like show me show me what you're doing so you made a bar chart great what question did you ask after you made that bar chart and that led you to go grab this data set cool what question did you ask with that or what did you try to answer or how did you try to compare or connect those together Um, another interesting facet of this project is trying to play with different representation styles of data, right? So you, there are lots of representation dilemmas out there, right? Because especially when you're des designing in static, right? So if you're not, you don't get to interact with it, right? It's just ink on a page or, you know, pixels on a screen and it's not doing anything, you really have to be judicious and kind of deliberate about how you're representing your data. So for example, uh, this Monsters and Ghosts of St. Paul, these are not actual monsters and actual ghosts. Um, it's more about uh, things humans have done to the landscape that have a lasting impact. Um, there are lots of, you know, phenomena in geography and an urban, um, urban geography especially that we make a decision and we we do something like tear down a neighborhood for an interstate and that has lasting repercussions throughout the ages right and throughout history on not only that community um that immediate community but for the larger city or even the larger region and how do you how do you represent that on a map you know it's really difficult it's a design challenge to kind of uh make data that's trapped in numbers and statistics and things and lines and points into something personal and kind of have that emotional impact on people and so that's what this is trying to represent it's like trying to add personal and like kind of almost the whimsical um to to the GIS, right, to the very analytical. So we have these GIS data sets here, the points and these lines uh, with some like hand drawings to try and kind of merge these two ideas together and kind of make a more personal uh, data-driven experience. So here's some uh, from, I'm just pulling from her um, progress journal here, some examples of things she experimented with. Um, so you can see that uh, you have an extra graphic over on the left that didn't really make it into the, the final spread. Um, and then she's showing all of her materials here in this uh, picture that she took. Um, and then her color palettes and, and fonts and so on and so forth. So kind of how they walked me through their design decisions and things like that. Um, another tenet of my design classes and just my classes in general is like, don't let what you know limit what you do. So um, for many of these students, you know, this was their first foray into kind of design software. I don't teach any specific software for this class. I just say, figure out what you need to figure out to get a product. Um, and then I offer support and I help connect people with resources. So for some of them, they wanted to you know, do every, all their data wrangling in R and then bring it into Adobe. Um, they all had, you know, Esri product to fall back on. So you could design this all in um, ArcMap or Arc Pro if you wanted to. Um, I don't believe anyone chose to do that. So that's, you know, take that how you will. <laughs> uh, some used Inkscape, which is kind of the, uh, the freeware version of Adobe Illustrator. It does, it does have some clunkiness to it. So it's not it's not as nice and as streamlined as Adobe. And some students got frustrated with that, but it is, you know, open source. And so that's something to think about when you're if you try to tackle a project like this. Um, so for this one, this uh, this was actually one of my TAs. He uh, designed his own watercolor palettes and then used them to symbolize his map over on the right. And he's he liked the watercolor because you're taught he was talking about how do boundaries actually manifest on the landscape. So how do borders and boundaries kind of you know physically show up um, in our landscape? And a lot of times they do and a lot of times they don't, but he thought this like kind of ethereal quality of watercolors was 
kind of fitting for the idea of a border, which is simultaneously uh, arbitrary and very real, right? So that that was an interesting kind of dichotomy and a mix of like handcrafted artistic methods with, you know, this GIS digital representation. So one of the biggest challenges in this project was um, just the idea of including stories that were not ours. You saw the class image, the, the class photo. Uh, we were primarily a white class um, by and large and mostly, um, students from the United States, though there were a couple international students in our class. And very few of them were actually from the area and I'm not a native to St. Paul I, either. So we were trying to figure out how do we include stories that are not ours to tell, right? What is a respectful way to do that? We don't wanna just leave out important stories um, because they're not of our community, but we also, uh, want to be respectful and and not kind of assume or tell a story that's not appropriate for us to tell. So um, we we kind of tackled that in a couple different ways. So uh, this was Elizabeth Fukujawa. She wanted to create uh, you know a little bit of a Dakota story narrative um, and thought that was important to include in this atlas, and I agreed with her. And one of the things she really wanted to do for this map was she wanted to orient the map south. And I thought that was a great idea because that's how the Dakota um, traditionally use their maps. So they usually have their maps oriented south on top. And But she also didn't want to have any settler infrastructure or boundaries on it. And I was like, whew, okay. So we're going to flip the map around and we're not going to have any settler colonial infrastructure or boundaries or placings. And I was like, I'm just a little concerned that people aren't going to be able to orient themselves like white settler community like me are not going to be able to orient themselves in the map with all of those challenges. I was like, what if we uh, make them turn the map around? So here's how it appears like in the print version. If you were flipping through the maps and spreads, you would come upon the Dakota spread like this. So uh, you have kind of the, the text on the right is facing upright, and that is for a white settler colonial viewer. Um, the text, if you turn it around, so you actually have to physically flip the atlas around so that uh, south becomes the top and they're able to then read all of the Dakota labels on there and um, kind of understand these different places and their their significance to um, the Dakota community. And another way she tried to kind of uh, tell this story without kind of uh, commandeering this story is to use sources that were written by and for the Dakota community and use direct quotes to include voices from the community. So those were a couple of the ways she tried to, to combat like the fact that she was not Dakota, is not Dakota. And um, I think for by and large it worked. Um, and it kind of makes this really interesting interactive static piece. So another way we could try to kind of um, allow for personal identity identity to come through uh, and be transparent about the fact that we were not Dakota and did not have ownership over the story and we're just trying to kind of relate was to allow every student, every author um, to kind of have a little blurb about themselves. Um, so in the back or like kind of at the end of each chapter, we put in these little blurbs about you know, who, who they are, where they're from, and they could really include anything they wanted in there. And then they also had an acknowledgement section because so many students worked with community members or um, other like kind of subject matter experts and things like that, people they wanted to thank for all of their time and understanding. We also said up in the introduction that, that hey, we're 
this is who we are and this is not meant to be you know a uh complete look at saint paul this is not the only stories of saint paul um it is not comprehensive and it's not meant to be um i want to be cognizant of time and uh just kind of make sure that we get to talk about the things that people want to talk about so i'm gonna tell you about this spread and then i think i'll just wrap up and we can if you guys have questions we can um address those and i can talk more about anything you're interested in um, so this is another one of my favorites, uh, all of these water bodies here. So, you know, in urban geography, and a lot of us already know this, but, you know, filling in water is, <clears throat> is a development process, right? So you kind of fill in the water body because you're like, hey, we need this land to, for more buildings and uh, infrastructure and things like this. And so a lot of these uh, old uh, water sources become buried like or become you know contained in sewers or you know holding uh swamps and things like that and so uh one of my this is again a ta spread here um went through historical descriptions and some historical maps and then recreated where approximate locations of where these water bodies would be so these are all hand-drawn kind of approximations of where these water bodies would be based on historical descriptions, legal descriptions, public land survey descriptions, and then also a few um, kind of hand sketches and, uh, and old maps and things like that. So it's really cool. But I love how she has this kind of very like GIS background map, the base map, so that we all can kind of see where we are in space. But then all of the data she collected she didn't want it to have this kind of precision element to it because she was like it's not precise it's based off description so it's my best guess of where these were so she has this kind of like hand-drawn quality um to these water bodies that are kind of no longer visibly present on the landscape all right so i kind of want to uh just hand it over um for questions and see if you guys have anything else you want to discuss. Uh, we went through many draft iterations and critiques, um, two formal critiques and then many informal. We also had to put it together and into chapters and stuff. Each student also had to take on some publishing roles. Um, so editing or creating a title page, writing the introduction and so on and so forth. Um, and then, like I said, we did a Minneapolis one the following year. So if you guys have questions or you want to talk about any of that more in depth, I'm happy to do so, but I want to have time for discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, so much. This is great. Yeah, if you could leave that slide there. Yeah, I will. Perfect. Can you also see the questions that have been posed by the group? I was going to um, read them out loud to to you and to the audience so the audience can i don't appreciate. believe i can see it or i just don't yeah okay let me let me so so thank you this that was really neat uh and we've definitely got a whole bunch of questions that have been coming in here let me um i'll start with uh one of the earlier ones so um let's see do you think that digital atlases may empower folks more by giving the ability to interact with the maps query add their own layers um how would you translate the idea of this creative atlas to something that you was that you were going to do online as an online interactive one how would you mm -hmm. what do you how would you manage that yeah those so, so that's a great question i love that um i think that yeah giving the user the ability to filter obviously now um your role right as a cartographer shifts from like designer to facilitator in that instance and so you have to kind of say you kind of have to anticipate what kind of questions are they going to want to ask and you really have to think about what is this for like what are they going to need to accomplish with this right is it just to like deliver statistics what it what kinds of tasks do you want them to be able to accomplish and i think that will really then kind of inform what what types of forms and what interactions uh should be available to to the user and then another thing to think about would be to in in this creative cartography sense 
how would you allow other voices in? So where are these data sets coming from? And what is considered authoritative, right? And maybe giving an option where people can add their own data. So that could be audio files of them, you know, talking about their own experience in this place, or it could just be simple comments or adding actual points to things or a drawing on the map or, you know, adding a photo of themselves. I don't know, it, it, it kind of depends, but I think, you know, user interaction and user input can be really powerful in those situations. Mm -hmm. It gets tricky, the ones like the map mashups that, that have, that allow user input like that. There's this tension between making it completely open and accessible and not requiring like a login to be able to do something like versus absolutely lowering the barrier. You know, that, that's another tension in with, uh, with, with access and democ you know, democratic, democratic lower D access to these, um, to the idea of an online collection, like who, who's able to actually manage the login and, and um, yeah. contribute to it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and again, I think that just kind of comes back to purpose, right? Like, right. what? Yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> what do you want to happen with this? What's the goal? Yeah. Um, how would you say these projects align or diverge with literature on qualitative GIS? Yeah, I I think that I think they're very. Um, I think they're very in line with each other. Um, and in, in my in my way of thinking, I kind of think of it as like a little bit of a spectrum. And I think uh, creative cartography uh, and you know critical cartography intersect in a couple ways. And one of them is this more qualitative side of GIS of like trying to include things that aren't necessarily in a spreadsheet um, and are kind of more uh, intangibles, right? Like things that are, that aren't things that you can make into point lines and <laughs> Um, and so trying to encode those things in a visual way is really difficult. Um, so trying to still represent it graphically. Um, I think a lot of the challenges that we see outlined in, in qualitative cartography is are the same challenges that you have in kind of cre this creative cartography or critical cart type thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a, a fair amount of overlap, similarity. I would, I would, there. I would say that's my personal opinion. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. There could be lots of people who disagree with me on there. <laughs> um, it, it makes sense to me. Um, there, I, uh, yeah, I, I, these type the, these, these, types of digital atlases or or print versions of these um, seem like, especially with undergraduate students, a really good way to get them into some of the big ideas in qualitative and critical GIS. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and, and there are a couple questions about student experiences here. Um, how much, tr um, how much, I guess you described how some of the student uh, students might have selected a type of focus which either maybe supported or challenged their their background experiences but um how much uh different uh were the students doing much hand drawing or using computer software to draw um how did you manage to bring students up to um through spatial visualization and design and a finished product in a single semester yeah, yeah, okay, so those are all great questions. So in our intro GIS course, which is a prerequisite for this, was a prerequisite for this class, we do teach uh, the basic principles of cartography. So it's it's an intro GIS and principles of cart class all in one. Uh -huh. um, makes it a beast of a class. Okay. <laughs> but uh, so that they're all coming in with kind of a baseline knowledge and then we're just building off of that. Um, that being said, we do have some, the vast majority of our class time was committed to logistical things for the Atlas. So coming up with the title or organizing the chapters or sharing where we were at in, the, in our spread design and so on and so forth or doing critiques. 
but there were a few sessions that we had available to uh, like learn, a, kind of go more in depth about why the principles of design are what they are. Um, so giving kind of basic graphic design principles. And then um, really how I taught it was just on the fly during their spreads, right? So like we taught it at a very individual level through their, their work on their spreads. Um, and then in terms of the technical know-how, um, student experience, that honestly is all of them. So they, I don't, we give one class period, like hour and a half demo of Adobe and they have yes. one like it's assignment and then they just figure it out. They Google what they need to Google. Um, they learn how to troubleshoot on the fly. They learn other programs. I know like a smattering of little things like, you know, some of them use Canva for this one little piece and then I did it and did some stuff in Adobe or like raw charts online and they'd pop their data in. It would spit out like this, you know, kind of circular graph and then they'd bring it into Adobe to finish it off and things like that. So um, yeah, we used a ton of different things and it's just kind of a, do what you got to do to get it done, which I think is a very real world. Approach. That's how most designers I know work is that they just piece together all this little stuff they know to make a final project. And yeah, yeah so. I imagine that in your first iteration, when it was taught in person, that this is the kind of thing where I, uh, students end up helping each other too. Yes. Like if they're together working in an evening on something in a lab, they're going to work work together. How did that tell us a little bit about the experience of doing this in the COVID semester? Yeah, yeah, that was that was the thing that um, that suffered the most for sure. And we had students drop kind of off the face, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think I had one student that didn't finish theirs um, and kind of dropped out of the class. But um, for the most part, we were able to kind of keep that community sense. One, because it was so strong on the front end, so it made it a little easier to reconnect. And honestly, I think students wanted an escape from what was happening in the world. And this, this class is like, while it's a lot of work, it's also a lot of fun, right? Like you get to design something and, and kind of lose yourself in one topic that presumably you're very interested in because you chose it. Um, so I think that really helped is that it was a different mode of thinking. It was a way to kind of escape what was happening um, just for a minute. And so we, I did build small cohorts between them. So they would have kind of weekly meetings with their cohort. And then I would like jump in and out of them. Um, to kind of facilitate different things. If there was an issue with one of the cohorts, then I would step in, but that didn't really become a factor. Were those um, organized in a way to like to purposefully like have a cohort that was working on more data collection issues or a cohort that was working on design or did it just work out however it worked out? Yeah, it was it was kind of a combination. There were some people who like only felt comfortable with certain people in the class and I, I, so I, based it kind of on comfort level, but also like, uh, also expertise. So okay. if I tried not to put like three people who had never used Adobe in the same. Right, right. Because that was, that would not be as helpful, so. Yeah, right. How have these atlases been received by the general public? Um, have, have, have you had a chance to share them uh, in St. In St. Paul and, and Minneapolis? Yeah, yeah. So the Minneapolis one, not as much because it did come out in uh, in May of uh, 2020, which um, since we are in the Twin Cities uh, was, a, was a big time for us uh, with George Floyd. So so we so no with Minneapolis, not so much, but St. Paul has been really well received. Um, it is in actually the library system here, the St. Paul Public Library bought a copy for each branch and um, they, they're wildly popular, I guess, being checked out. And so I've given a number of talks at the St. Paul Public Library, and we did a workshop with a few of the students who were in the class and some community members and talked about creative mapping and creative cartography. And that was really fun. So by and large, people love them. Uh, and when they find out, like, my class did it, they'll be like, oh, I love the coffee spread. I love coffee. I go to all the coffee 
jobs, you know, and so people just want to talk about it and they want to talk about how it relates to their personal experience in St. Paul. So very much uh, a lot of people have engaged with it and I think a lot of people have found it um, interesting and they want to engage. So there are there are printed editions for sale that you could. There are. Um, here, they, here, I have one right here. But, oh, yeah. it's beautiful. Nice. Yeah. I like the cover. Did a student do the cover too? Yeah, yeah. Very talented student named Dio Kramer uh, took the lead on that. But then um, a lot of the other students helped execute the final design. But um, and then the Minneapolis cover is very similar, but I don't think I have a copy within the reach here. Um, but it's a similar design to kind of complement as well, but it's blue. So we have red. Uh -huh. the, uh, being able to be relatively local and collect data on the ground made a big difference. Are you are you going to revisit this course again in locally or how will that how might that work if you think about um, f having a different geographic focus? Yeah, I that is a question I get a lot and I'm not sure how I will do that. I think that is one of the most important parts of of this course is that field work component and in our department and our geography department here at Mac, we we do a lot of civic engagement and kind of like on the ground field work and so that was something I really wanted to be a part of the class. So I have gotten calls about, "Hey, can you do this?" For Minnesota or can you do it for here and I would love to say yes to everyone but of course the ever-present problem is funding right so I need to find a way to help students get up there if if we're doing a in an atlas of Duluth and so yeah I'm not sure if we'll just kind of I mean there are lots of different subjects still remaining for St. Paul and Minneapolis so we could do that the other things I've toyed with are like more themes so um, one that's come up a lot is like immigration. So we'll have a lot of uh, immigrant communities here in the Twin Cities and they, they've been very, uh, you know, they, they've really helped shape the city and contributed so much to the, to the fabric of the, of the urban environment. And so I think that would, could be really cool. So we, we've talked, I'm in talks with um, the Swedish Institute here um, and they have a program that celebrates like immigration you know, past, present, and future. So, and so I think we might do something with them. Okay. I, I have a, a memory um, of students at McAllister having done something maybe a little bit similar in an urban studies course where they just focused on one block yes. of the city and, and did a cartographic history of, of the, pat the changes in that yes. one block. Great, great memory. Wow. Um, yes. Yeah, so I, I believe, and you said you knew Carol, right? Carol. Gerson. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Carol okay. Gerson was a good friend of mine. Yeah. Yeah. So she, she's my predecessor's predecessor here. Um, so it was Carol and then Birgit Muhlenhaus and then myself. Uh, and so I think, was that Carol's time? I'm not uh, I, sure. I, it was either when Carol was there or it, I think it was someone else who was teaching some urban geography, I think, but yeah, I so I know, I think David Lanegren had his fingers in that. Um, and then, yes, we had an urban geography class and I believe they created like an atlas basically of a block. And so yeah. just that one block through time and who lived there and how did it change, uh, you know, businesses and uh, right. community and so on and so forth. And I think, I mean, it's really amazing. I don't know that I have a copy of that, but yes, that that was from McAllister. That's another idea of how to continue having this this learning approach. You yes. got a lot of single blocks that you could keep doing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so many, so many. So that would be really All interesting. All right, as well. excellent. Um, one other person has wondered um, if there's any way to uh, for sale or to access a PDF version of it, or is it just the, it's the website or the hard copy? Yeah, so it's just website or hard copy. Uh -huh. um, but we um, and I don't I if um, I can send a, a link if people are interested in getting a copy. No, uh, I, well, if if we can if we could share the link to be able to purchase this, that would be great. And it looks like you've got the links there to be able to look at online. Yeah, uh, if you're, it. why don't we do it this way? If you're interested in purchasing a copy, just email me. So it's yeah. 
nep at mcallister.edu. Um, and that way I'll put you on my list. We don't have an active um, website up right now for purchasing because it's it's just me. So, <laughs> uh, and right, it's just like coming back for the first time in the semester. Yeah. Um, it's only me doing shipping and inventory and all that stuff. So um, I will make it live in a couple months here. And then we'll, I have copies of both Minneapolis and St. Paul. So um, yeah, I'll just put you on the list and then I'll send out that email when everything's live and ready to go and, and then you can purchase a copy. We, we just, we, um, we sell them at cost. So no one is uh, profiting from, um, from student work. It's just uh, all of the proceeds fund the next print of like whatever Atlas is next. So for the next class, or we just buy more copies and kind of cycle. Yeah, yeah no, that's great. I mean, it's a, a, a great way to be able to um, produce and distribute these types of things. That's yeah. super. Okay, I uh, well, any, if anyone has a last question, um, feel free to pop it in the space. Thanks so much, everyone, for asking these questions. Um, thank you, Ashley, for sharing your time. Uh, we were finally able to schedule this. One of Ashley's um, former students was one of UCGIS's summer interns um, several years ago, uh, Julia Evelyn. And Julia had uh, knew that this. Uh, description of Ashley's work would be of great interest to our to our audience and Julia was correct and Ashley so thank you so much for your time for sharing this with us you have a lot of people who uh, teach undergraduate GIS and cartography who are have been part of this group and I know that they've uh, uh, enjoyed listening to you and hearing about how you've managed to do this so well yeah, and I would I I just want to reiterate I'm happy to share materials or have a longer conversation if people are thinking of uh, tackling this kind of project because it I know it really helped me to have other people to talk through these ideas with and stuff. So I'm more than happy to you know schedule a Zoom or hop on a call or just via email whatever you you are comfortable with. Um, but please reach out. I love talking about this kind of stuff um, and I love teaching. So I'm happy to talk about it. That is super. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank everyone, thank you for joining us today on this Thursday. As I said before, this is the first in our series of seminars this um, academic year. Look at our website. You'll find some other ones coming up, up in October. And then we'll be announcing more soon after that as well. This has been recorded and uh, once the recording gets processed, there'll be you'll get an email with a link and then the link will also be up on our website. So awesome. everyone, thanks very much. Thanks again, Ashley. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.